thank you very much. Um, all right, so as I'm sure you've all already gathered, I have you know, too many things to say. So I'm going to kind of pick some of them <laughs> um, and, uh, and hopefully um, give a kind of flavour of, of some of the ways that I think about this problem, which is extremely similar um, in lots of ways um, to the way, the way that uh, we heard in the previous talk. But I think there are some differences and there are some kind of ways I think that the debate can be helpfully framed. So hopefully I'll give a bit of a flavour um, for that. Um, I think there's some disagreements in particular about how it might help with the question of emergent space time, although I don't doubt at all that it does. Um, and then perhaps the, I don't really think this is a disagreement, but perhaps the biggest difference between the kind of functionalism that I've been advocating um, for a few years um, and uh, perhaps what Chris was calling the Geneva approach is that I think that there is one, I mean, I think a lot of the, the meat of the space is going to be in characterising the functional role. <coughs> um, particularly, uh, I don't want to say that there's only one way to do that, but I do think there's rather a promising way to do that that's been developed um, in what uh, Chris was calling the Oxford um, approach. Cracking up there's something like the Oxford School of Space Time Functionism, especially since I'm not at Oxford and the person talks about it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, it's 30, 40 miles down the road that I get it. That's I mean, it's, true. You're, and you're there, right. there are a number of people in Oxford presently. Yes, and it's, uh, and it's, it's very much inspired by Oxford. So I think there's a sort of, um, what I'd like to do here, if I can, is also give you a flavour for why I think one particular way of thinking about functional role is going to be really useful um, and applicable. As it doesn't mean that should, that should be the only game in town um, by any means. Uh, I do think functionalism is the only game in town, but I don't think that inertial frame functionalism, which I'll try and advocate, is the only game in town. But I think it's a good game, and people should get into it. Um, all right. So as you can see from the outline, this is, yeah, look, I've been too many things, six things in a 40 minute talk. Um, but, um, but I'll try and say, some general things about uh, space-time functionalism, then tell you what inertial frame functionalism is. And this is the thing that may be too much to pack into a talk, but I mean, lots of, I think a lot of approaches to functions of the proof of the pudding is really in the eating. You need to talk about a functional role and then show how it's usefully applied to some particular piece of space-time structure. So I'm going to try and give you a flavour for how that works um, in the case of inertial frame functionalism. And one example that was put to me as a counterexample to inertial frame functionalism, and, um, perhaps I'm becoming more entrenched because I tend to think counterexample for just risk to my mill, which is the most toxic thing. <laughs> um, all right, so what's space-time functional? Functionalism. Well, here's my version, and, and there are some subtleties here. Um, space-time is a functional concept. Um, the word concept there, I think, is important, actually, and it's important um, when one tries to articulate the differences between functionalism in this kind of uh, realm and, say, philosophy of mind. That is, a field or object space temporal by virtue of playing a certain kind of role kind of role in our theory, space time by virtue of what it does, not what it is. So the similarities um, should be pretty um, But why am I talking about concepts? I think that is um, an important question. It's very unfashionable um, to talk about concepts. Um, I think that there are important differences between the project of functionalizing something like space time, um, which I do take it. Um, is a theoretical term. I, I mean, we might have something like folk theoretical attitudes about space and time, but I don't think anyone has any reliable folk theoretical attitudes about space time. Um, I think most of our folk theoretical, folk theoretical attitudes about space and time boil down to um, kind of rather bad intuitions about preferred reference frames, for example, that we have known for a long time about in physics. So I think one should think of space time as a theoretical term, a term like you know, electron or electromagnetic field or Pick your favourite thing that's not totally straightforward to pick out um, via extension. Um, and that we don't, you know, the man on the street isn't a particularly li reliable guide to the meaning of. Um, so I think there's no theory independent way to establish reference to space time. That's going to change the game that we're playing here a little bit. Um, I think that to some extent, I mean, I've had a long time when I was thinking about space time functions and trying to work out how things I thought about space time mapped on to all these debates in philosophy of mind. Debates about identity theories, role versus realizer functionalism. Um, and one of the things I've started to think is that if one, the debate here has more in common with debates about thinking about theoretical terms and trying to think about how we evaluate concepts uh, in, um, uh, in physics than it does with the traditional mental functionalism debate. There's still some nice analogies, you know. 
it's fun to bash the qualia analogy, right? Um, I enjoyed that at various points myself. But I think the various things that the role versus realizer debate may just be inapplicable because I think there are various debates in the philosophy of mind that depend on the fact that I can pick it out by something like introspection, what I mean by a pain state, um, and I can pick it out in somebody else by something like a functional role, and then I can claim to pick out a neural state or something like a brain scan. And there are these different kinds of access, and then we can have these debates about what the identities are between the things that we're accessing in those different ways. I think that a robustly theoretical term is a little bit different because we're only reading this one way of establishing reference for access to it, and that's via a theory that connects it with empirical evidence indirectly in a theoretical context. So I think that's going to change um, the, f the, the options on the table and the frame of the debate. And I think that means that not everything can be neatly imported from the philosophy of mind into the space time functionalism context. Good. Um, but I do think we still need to think about the concept of space time. So I mean, so I think somebody who is a fan of the philosophy of mind debate might say, well, you know, so much the worse, you know, this kind of really conceptual talk you're going to have end up having I mean, to engage it, it's much worse to find debate than this one where we have lots of um, sort of referential routes uh, uh, into. But, um, but I think it's still really crucial to talk about um, the concept of space-time. And the word concept automatically puts up red flags in certain kinds of traditions in modern philosophy. So I think I should say something about what one thinks this kind of debate is about. Um, but there are good reasons why we don't think of ourselves as philosophers of science as conceptual analysts anymore. It just looked like some kind of view where what we go around doing is stipulating necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of a theoretical term was a really hopeless project. Um, it didn't take into account the fact that we seem to apply the same concept across different theories, but these concepts shift and change in awkward ways. Um, if you think about entropy or kinetic energy or force and the way that those notions change across theories, you might think, well, a bit of a fool's errand to try and be pinning down concepts. But of course, if you think about, say, a concept like entropy, and you think about the debate that goes on at the moment about black hole thermodynamics and whether we can apply certain concepts in black hole thermodynamics, you can see that actually um, one of the roles for philosophers of physics has got to be something like working out under what circumstances we're applying concepts acceptably, picking out continuous conditions, at least working out to what extent some concept is continuous over theories. Because it looks like Otherwise, you're just at risk of kind of making rampant um, category mistakes or something like that. I mean, it seems like there's a substantive issue about whether thermodynamics applies to black holes. So there's still a lot of good conceptual work to be done um, in tracking, understanding how our concepts change, in making sure you're not importing old conceptual assumptions in a context where the concept has changed in certain kinds of ways. Um, and so the kind of view of this that I see this project being engaged in is seeing the philosopher not as this kind of you know, necessary and sufficient condition giver, this stipulator or judge, but this sort of conceptual housekeeper, making sure that we know what we're doing when we try and move into new theoretical concepts. Um, and I think that's really particularly important when you're keeping track of space-time structure um, in theories, because space-time has this very particular role to play in our theories. And in particular, it's associated, at least at a phenomenological level, if we think we've picked out space-time at the level at which we do experiments, it has a kind of automatic empirical import that other theoretical terms don't necessarily have. So I mean, most of what we do when we're doing uh, measurements boils down to ultimately measuring to distances and times. And there are lots of assumptions you make about just the ability to read those off the space-time structure. And if you get those wrong, you're just going to get the empirical content of the theory wrong. Now, there might be longer routes around to work out the empirical content, but generally we're going to use space-time structure as a shortcut uh, to it. So you'd be better, better be very aware of any kind of break with that kind of association. Um, and of course, a major motivation for thinking about this kind of thing in the same way that you want, might want to think harder about black holes because, about entropy because you've been inspired by realizing it's a tricksy concept in the case of a black hole. Um, theories of quantum gravity provide the same kind of force uh, to force us to think about the concept of space-time. Because people make grand interpretive claims for them, right? They claim, make claims about space-time structure. They say that there are emergent space-times or discrete space-times, or space-times with many more dimensions than four. Um, and if you're going to start importing this concept into those kinds of contexts, you better be very clear about what you mean. Of course, if somebody's very clear about what they mean, then there's only so much to the debate about whether it's still really space-time in this kind of project. It's just um, 
concept. If someone wants to claim the space-time concept is enormously more flexible than, say, I think it is, it's not obvious that there's a deep metaphysics debate to be had, um, on my view. But you better be careful about what you're doing. That's the main point. Okay. Um, so, I think a lot of the meat in this debate is going to come down to them saying what kind of roles we think space-time plays in various theories and how we pick out the space of temporal role. Um, but before we do that, and I mean, maybe I, this is sort of mostly preaching to the choir, because there's obviously lots of you're really interested in, and to be able to, as some of us have said in the last talk, but even without the details, um, you can think about uh, a couple of people who would object to space time. I mean, I guess the question is, sometimes, sometimes I give talks on space time functionalism, and everyone comes up to me afterwards and goes, we were all space time functionalists all along. Who knew? What a great word for the view that every, everybody said for had to begin with, and I think, in a sense, you know, it's, 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 it's always tricky, people agree with you too much about the way you view right? But, but on the other hand, I'm like, great, let's just be really clear that that's what we're doing. But there are some people who would naturally object, and, and they do exist, and sometimes I find them a little wild. Um, so, um, the two kinds of people um, are, I characterise as the kind of mathematical fetishist, they might, you know, hang out in Irvine sometimes. <laughs> Um, although if you push them hard, they often become much more sensible. So, trouble with any sort of extreme view is that often become sensible when you push them hard. Um, so a mathematical event just thinks that maybe really just the truth isn't a big issue here. We can look at the mathematical form of theories and work out uh, what space-time structure is. Um, another person is the kind of metaphysical uh, fetishist, if you like. Um, you might find them on the East Coast in the United States, it's sensible people in Europe, um, uh, So. So, um, that's the kind of person, person who thinks that, look, we have a kind of metaphysical grasp on space time, it's this sort of container, and we know what it is. Um, you can say plenty about arguing against these views, but I think, I think hopefully I'm preaching to the choir, so I'm going to say, like, oh, both of these are just non starters, right? You should be a space time functionalist, because these are the other games, and they're bad games, so it's the only game in town. Um, the mathematical, I mean, any kind of mathematical criteria for working out what space time is is just going to fall on the fact that we're really good at using mathematics in thousands of different ways. And we can use geometrical tools to model all kinds of spaces that are not space time. It's a very hard ground point. Um, uh, you can also use very diverse objects to model a space time. And we know this from kind of theory. So <coughs> thinking, that, oh, I see, you know, I see a metric and associated affine connection, and thus I have identified a space time, is not a particular helpful way. Unless the word space time there means something is a mathematical term or not. Jim Weatherall sometimes tells me that I'm mistaking the mathematical word space time for the physical word space time. Again, fine, but let's be careful about what we mean. Um, uh, so you will see in a kind of differential geometry textbook, you know, I laid out a manifold, I laid out these things upon it, as if there's a kind of act of representational creation that you go about if you manage to describe the coherence of geometrical objects. You have thus described a possible space time, and I'm not sure if um, that's really a coherent view. Um, the containment view, what's wrong with that? Well, we've, we've heard a bit about that. I mean, um, there's, if you think the space time's a container, you're either going to flesh that out in functionistically acceptable terms, for example, by talking about the kind of localization role for a container that um, uh, we talked about in the last talk, or I think this is just a metaphor. I think if you try and push the notion of a container, and this is where the analogy with Quelia, um of course, comes in, because at least um, when you're trying, the, the container, the person who objects to functionalism on the basement of the containment view is uh, the kind of the parallel person who thinks, you know, who says that zombies or uh, et cetera, there could be uh, beings that satisfy uh, the functional role for a mental state, um, but don't have it. But of course, the conceivability of their argument is based on the fact that we have a special introspective access to Quelia. And even though not everybody thinks that works in philosophy of mind, at least there's a prima facie argument that you know you know what it's like to be in a pain state. There's no analogue in the case um, of space-time. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think that once you've taken out the kind of functionalistically uh, acceptable part of this view, you just have kind of metaphor left, um, and there's nothing very useful in it. So space-time functionalism is the only game in town. Um, I guess it's going to be pushed back on in one or two places in this in this conference, which is great. Um, because I love it when these aren't um, and also, And also, I'd love to, to see more. I mean, I've, one of my problems with arguing against the same years is it's been hard to find people kind of standing up and, and giving the counter argument, which of course means I'm inventing my <coughs> two accusers. So it's, it's nice not to be them. So fight back, that would be great. 
I'm right, so let's, but, but let's for the moment suggest, I suppose, that quite a lot of you are convinced that there's something good about space time functionalism. Then the question is, what are the things that's meant to be good about it, aside from the fact maybe it's just necessary because it's the only game in town, um, is uh, that it's helpful. And particularly, I, I think it's very helpful for interpreting classical space time theories, but one place you might think it's going to be really helpful um, is in the case of quantum gravity, if you think that space time might turn out to be the kind of thing that's more fundamental. You might think space time functions is going to be really helpful uh, for um, allowing us to see how that's a possibility. A kind of categorical container notion of space-time might struggle, rather, to see how it could be, how the fundamental background container could be anything other than fundamental. Right? Space-time functionalism allows, uh, seems to allow for non-fundamental space-times. And the important thing, of course, is there's nothing in the functionalist definition that says what kind of thing has to realise the functional role. The thing that fills the functional role could be something fundamental or it could be something non-fundamental. Um, and so, in the same way that it accommodates multiple realizability, if that's the right word for it, the same way it accommodate, could accommodate lots of different things filling a uh, functional role, it could accommodate non-fundamental things filling a functional role. Um, now I think that of course what one counts as the thing that's filling the functional role is now going to depend quite a lot on rather more general points about how one thinks about levels in physics and how one thinks about physical ontology. If you're happy to reify non-fundamental entities, if you're kind of emergentist and like you think there's a whole load, you know, I think there are tables and chairs and people and they're not fundamental. Um, but I don't find it terribly edifying uh, to, to say oh, all there really are is, is fundamental stuff. But of course that's a, it's a metaphysical debate. Um, but if you happen to reify non-fundamental entities, then it's going to make perfect sense to say that whatever place is based on modern sub theory is rightly thought of as an emergent or a non-fundamental uh, state or entity in the hence that space-time is emergent or non-fundamental. Um, if one has this view that I, I don't particularly subscribe to, but, I, but plenty of people do, a sort of strong reductions of all there is is the fundamental stuff, then the only available role filter is going to be fundamental entities. And you're going to have to, and this is going to be a kind of tricky question that's going to be done on a case by case basis, you're going to have to see space time as either fundamental itself or reduced to something fundamental. Um, and I suspect that Mikhail Aspel's talk tomorrow is going to kind of argue, given that, that <coughs> the primitive ontologist is probably. Um, one, of, one of the people that um, subscribes to this kind of strong reductionism, uh, I, I suspect that um, he's going to think that, look, ultimately the argument's going to pull down to the fact that um, space time's going to be reduced to something fundamental. But functionalism itself is neutral on this stuff, um, in my view. So functionalism itself <coughs> is going to allow for either of these views, depending on what, what you think goes on elsewhere. Um, in the kind of emergence versus reduction levels, high level ontology um, debate. Now, here is, I think, a difference between myself and myself and this. Um, on that view, space time functionalism allows for emergent space time. I think it's very helpful in that it can just accommodate emergent space time. But it's not really doing any work in explaining it except in explaining how it's possible. How space time could be the kind of thing that's emergent. So there's a good job explaining that. But it's not going to explain the emergence relation itself. Um, if you want to make a claim that space time structure in a given theory is emergent, you're going to have to say in what sense you think it's emergent. And then there are kind of accounts in the table of what one means by emergence. You can worry about some sort of limits, and a different view, and can, you can get going on that debate. So what you're doing is accommodating that debate within a space time framework rather than the functionalism doing the work for you. Um, so I think there's a kind of contrast between two kinds of cases you might have. Um, and I think that depending on what view of emergence you have, you might want to think of one of these as an emergent space time structure and not the other. Um, so one thing I've been kind of interested in, um, I think it's misspelled, interested with that. Um, but um, you might have a theory of quantum gravity that picks out the structure that fills the space time role rather directly. And I think there's kind of an interesting example of this in some versions, and some of you have heard me know about this before, but in some versions of non-commutative um, quantum gravity, where the non-commutative dynamics itself can directly pick out a structure of inertial frames. So you don't have something like a manifold structure. It's not even clear that you should think of a manifold structure as being emergent. You should just think that actually the dynamical space-time structure is directly picked out by the theory. And to make a claim of emergence is probably a little bit strong. And um, so you could have that kind of theory of quantum gravity, 
Or presumably you can have, I mean, one of the things that people can be kind of assuming will happen in something like loop quantum gravity, I take it, um, is you have some theory that's geometric um, is, I think you should say indirectly, but, um, uh, by taking, for example, a continuum limits with discrete, discrete structure. So if you think that limits have something to do with emergence, back on that, you might think that the sense in which the whole of GR kind of comes out as a higher level theory on some kind of emergent basis by taking an appropriate continuum limit um, would be more like a case of genuine emergence of space time structure. Um, but both of those could be accommodated in the functionalist framework. Um, so in the first case, you just might think that the relation between the underlying theory and the space time role filler is too intimate for total emergence. Um, on the latter, perhaps not. But there's going to be lots of work in the details of working out what you um, think is going on here and what you mean by emergence. Um, so I think this is a point of difference. Um, uh, because in uh, Lama Mutri, 2018, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know what dates to give papers. Um, uh, one of the things that um, Russell and Chris say is that they'd like functionalism to explain the emergence of space time rather than merely allow for it. So, one of their kind of stated contrasts with my point of view is that I'm not doing enough to kind of explain the emergence of space time. And they think that something like Kim's view of functional reduction is going to be really helpful here. I'm nothing against this particular picture. I just don't think it's going to help you um, explain the emergence of space-time rather than allow either. So this is the, the schema we saw in the last talk, FR1, uh, the sort of two-step reduction, which um, <coughs> apart from thinking that this could happen without reduction happening, um, I'm perfectly happy with. So the first thing we do is we look at space-time and we work out how to functionalize the concept and we talk about what functional role is. Um, and we have that debate. And then the second thing that we do is look at a particular theory um, and explain how something fills the functional role in a particular theory. Now, of course, Kim, I mean, the R in there stands for reduction, and Kim intended that as a model of reduction. Um, explicitly, um, and Wittricker, um say it's sort of neutral between function, uh, between uh, reduction and emergence, um, which in a sense I think is right because it just doesn't say, well, it doesn't say a whole lot about this thing that's um, filling the role. Um, I completely agree, by the way, that emergence and reduction are compatible on any sensible view that's going to do justice to the way we use those terms in physics. Um, just, but their mere compatibility doesn't mean they're not different. Like, two things can be compatible, but importantly, conceptually different. And I happen to think there's an interesting debate to be had about what we count as emergent structures in physics that has a lot to do with what one thinks <coughs> levels are and what one thinks paratology is. Um, that, that should characterize emergence in some way that's compatible with reduction, but such that not all cases of reduction are cases of emergence. Um, I think if you think that this could be a, this could express one of two relations, reduction or emergence, you've got to think that there's some kind of account of, and you think there's any difference between those two things, you're going to have to acknowledge that we need some kind of account of emergence um, to cash it out if we want to talk about emer emergence space times. <coughs> I also think that you can perfectly well have something like that schema happening with nothing that looks like reduction or emergence on the table. Um, in as much as I sort of take it that that kind of definition just applies whenever we're in. I'm thinking of this project as looking into a theory and thinking which pieces of structure are space time in this theory. I've got this kind of functionalized space time concept. How do I apply it? And um, I think you can do that in cases where it doesn't look like there's any reduction or emergence around. So, this is where I think the case of classical theories is important. Um, I think one case of functionalism is the fact that it's a great way to think about general relativity itself. And it's kind of a blunt way you think, look, is the metric field space time a general relativity? There are various debates that seem to turn on that. And then you say, look, um, let's define the space time functional role. And then the metric field plays that role. Fantastic, so metric field space time. But there's nothing, no emergence or reduction going on in that picture. There's just a question of concept application. Like, people were arguing about whether the metric field should be thought of as a matter field or a space-time field, and you come and you say, no, it's a space-time field because it plays a space-time world. Um, so it looks to me like you can have something like this uh, scheme, this FR1 and FR2 schema with reduction and emergence just being completely out of the picture. Um, maybe the problem is that you can't really apply the, the letter of that schema 
because it refers explicitly <coughs> to higher level and lower level properties. And of course, what's going on in general relativity is not that you have higher level space time and then you show how lower level metric fields instantiates it. Um, although I actually think that I mean, there are interesting debates to be had about how you think about effective space time structure in GR. Okay. Uh, it's fairly good how much is to abstract. I suspect James might raise some of these interesting points uh, in his talk. Um, but look, I think that's, that's fine. It perhaps might be absolutely true that the letter of that um, functional reduction schema only applies when you already have preconceived levels. But I also think that the whole job of an account of an emergence, if you wanted to explain the emergence of space-time, part of what you'd be trying to explain is the level talks, the levels talk in the first place. Um, so if you only get out a kind of link to emergence by importing the thought that there are already two different levels that you're talking at, you're kind of presupposing the thing that you're uh, claiming to explain. So I think this functional structure account presupposes some understanding of reduction emergence rather than explaining it. That doesn't mean I think it's a bad scheme. I just think that it's, it's not going to do quite as much work um, as you might um, hope it does. There's going to be a separate debate to be had about whether particular entities in quantum gravity count as emergent. Um, OK, good. All right. Um, I mean, when did we start? Oh, sorry. Um, 25 past 11. So, uh, 20 minutes. Right. Good. Um, OK. So, I think space-time functionalism, at this point, you know, you're all on board, we disagree maybe about what it does for the emergence uh, debate, but you know, most of us think we should be space-time functionalists. What should we be doing now? Well, now I think what we should be doing is having a debate about um, the role that space-time plays in our theories. And Despite the fact that I kind of push one role, I really don't think that that means that there's a single new open role. I don't think, I mean, I happen to think that there's a particular way of characterizing kind of a shorthand for a bunch of roles that turns out to be really handy. Um, but I think there may be several, and I think that we can have constructive debates about the ways in which different kinds of roles for space time come apart in different contexts and different theories. Um, I think all the functionalists is really committed to is saying that's where the interpretive action is. When we're talking about interpreting space time theories, one way to be really clear on what we're doing is to say, oh, look, this bit of structure in this new theory is instantiating the space time in the following sense, and this one is doing rather a different thing. And that might be all there is to be said about some theory of quantum gravity, right? You might just have to note that there are two different kinds of roles being played by two different kinds of theory, um, two different kinds of structure. Um, and I think that's all fine. Um, and debates about the interpretation of space time theories are best conducted as debates about the sense in which different structures build different possible roles for space time. Of course, it doesn't mean there's nothing to choose between in all of the cases. I think sometimes you've got a very minimal role for space time in one sense and rather a richer one in the other, and you can point out that uh, that might lend credence to interpretive play. So one place where I think that's going on, um, although um, it's my slight embarrassment, this is you know, uh, space time functionist view that kind of took David Wallace to point out to me. It's very hard to work out how and why I disagree with some of this for a long time. And then uh, David Wallace came in and pointed out that there's this debate between, um, if you don't know this debate, it's not that helpful, maybe some of you do. Um, the debate between Simon Saunders and myself over, over whether Newtonian theories are best set in Newton Cartan with this very sort of minimal slight relation of space time with Newton Huygens space time. And I think one way of looking helpfully at that kind of interpretive debate was to realise that what's going on is that I have this kind of rich conception of space time structure based on this kind of inertial frame functionism, and Simon Saunders is operating this incredibly minimal notion of the role for space time where it just expresses something like a maximum symmetry group. And one of the things you learn interestingly is even in Newtonian theories, those two roles can come apart. Um, and I think that the space time functionists should be able to accommodate this kind of debate. Um, because in as much as I think you probably can, not he puts in these terms, make Saunders' conception of a kind of maximal symmetry group space time uh, mm -hmm. functionistically acceptable, you can just see this as an inter internal debate. But the debate is hugely clarified, and I think was hugely clarified by this paper by David Wallace, um, by noting that that's what's going on. That you're disagreeing about the role for space time, and that's where I think uh, space time functionalism as a broad project can be enormously helpful, not just in quantum gravity context, but in older, older debates and other types of space time things. Um, how much disagreement can we accommodate and still think there's something like a single functional role for space time? Um, so, uh, 
Dave Baker has recently written um, uh, a paper about space-time functionalism, kind of uh, pressing certain kinds of disagreements uh, with me. And one of the things he thinks is that we should think of the space-time concept as a cluster concept. That's something really helpful. So uh, there are jointly sufficient but no necessary conditions in a cluster concept. So spell out different functional roles and just, you know, some bunch of them are filled and then we call it space-time. Um, I kind of agree. I mean, I don't want to be uh, stipulative about space-time roles. Um, and I think we need a notion of theoretical concept here that accommodates disagreement and theory change. I'm not sure about trying to borrow the cluster concept literature for this, just because I think it's a little underdeveloped, and I don't think that it's sufficiently tied to thoughts about theory change and science to make it particularly helpful. Um, so, I mean, one of my problems here is that I think when you come down to questions about how many things do you need to fulfill to be the space-time concept, there are some really tricky issues that um, sit at the heart of what we're doing as philosophers of physics, but that we often try and avoid because they're too much like doing real philosophy, um, about um, how concept shifts, how they move. Um, if you've ever worked your way through Mark Wilson, Wilson's giant pink book, you'll perhaps appreciate that it's really hard to think about this stuff. Um, and, I, and I sort of suspect that something like the giant pink book is necessary to really spell out um, the, uh, uh, what one should really say about theoretical concepts. Um, but so I'm not averse to this, but I think it might be a simplification too. Um, the other thing to say about Baker, this is, this is an unpublished manuscript, but um, one of the things that Dave Baker pushes to me is that uh, in the cluster there should be a role for fundamentality. And I'm uncomfortable with that because I think we should be committed for the re previous reasons to notions, um, to functionalistically exceptional, um, acceptable notions being the only thing in the space-time concept. Um, so, unless, so if you want to cash out fundamentality in functionalist terms, which perhaps you can, um, then that's sort of fine. Um, of course, much in the context of a gravity swap. Interesting in certain kinds of theories, but if it's cluster concept, you're going to be able to give it up, so <coughs> fine. Um, but, but you've got to be very careful that introducing considerations of fundamentality into your concept, to saying it's more space timey in some sense if it's fundamental, isn't just a backdoor for reintroducing this containing metaphors that I think are not functionalistically acceptable. Okay. So, what is the functional role? Um, functionalists should let a thousand flowers bloom, but. All that said, because a lot of the interpretive work we're going to do on the individual theories is going to rely on a very a reasonably, discreetly, parsimoniously articulated functional role, I think that there is a lot of work to be done um, by this view, this Oxford view, this view that's inspired by the dynamical relativity of Harvey Brown and Robert Pooley, I think does a surprisingly good job of capturing a whole bunch of different roles that we think about for space time, including certain senses of lo localization including notions about area, distance, and time, um, and uh, notions of inertial structure. So I think that one pretty good way of getting on with the job, and then we can have debates about what this doesn't do, um, is to say the functional role will be filled by some structure, if that structure defines a local structure of inertial frames. Um, for that to work, you need a really thick definition of inertial frame. So this isn't meant to just capture the idea that space-time structure covers natural motion between falling bodies or something. It's meant to be a much more substantive definition for that, than that. So let's define inertial frames as the frames with respect to which free, force free bodies, if such a thing exists, move at constant velocities. This particular one, the laws of physics take some form, a particularly simple one, with respect to coordinates and inertial frame. And there's some kind of universality clause, all bodies and physical laws pick out the same equivalence class of inertial frames. Um, if you pack a bit more, so you pack all of this into the notion of inertial frame, you're going to capture, at least in classical theories, a lot of, uh, a lot of the roles that we take space time to play. Uh, why do it? Well, I mean, I think part of proof of building is meeting, it works, but I mean, the link between notion of space time is kind of an obvious one. Um, there is this big tie to Harvey Brown's work, so this isn't how he intended it. You can read Harvey Brown's book as one long argument for the applicability of inertial frame functionalism. Um, and perhaps this is very worth very briefly saying. I think one of the nice things about this kind of view is that it, it's nice for things to tie into previously accepted bits of um, uh, interpretive lore in philosophy of physics. And if you think hard about the definition of inertial frame functionalism, 
it implies a matching between the relevant symmetries, the external symmetries, the dynamics, and the space-time symmetries. So if you think that what you might call Ehrman's prescription, the idea that you match your space-time symmetries to your dynamical symmetries is a large part of how we identify space-time structure, that's going to drop out of this definition. We're going to capture that in the definition. That's a nice desideratum. Um, but mostly, I just think this works. This is really helpful. It's, I mean, I think it's been helpful for me in sort of solving our determination debates of certain kinds. I think it's helpful in certainly some contexts in um, quantum gravity. And when people criticize it, I tend to think, oh, but wait, I can accommodate your count, for example. And then I think it's even better for you. Um, so I'm running out of time. But maybe perhaps I'll very quickly try and say one piece of structure. And this is a classical piece of structure. Um, so perhaps if you're primarily interested in quantum gravity, um, uh, this won't seem like a directly relevant example, but of course it is in some sense because it's a quantum example. And so, um, so one piece of space-time structure that you might or might not think is a good idea to postulate um, uh, is an orientation field. So Dave Baker suggested to me, look, here's a problem. If you thought that orientation fields were the kinds of things that we needed uh, in our space-time structure. There should definitely be space-time structure, but they're totally not captured by inertial structure. Um, so what does the orientation field do? So this is in the classical context. It induces a sense of handedness everywhere in space-time. Um, it's I mean, the best way to represent it by a completely anti-symmetric tensor field, but if you want to just try to do it quickly, just think of introducing a handed tetrad everywhere in space-time. Modulo problems with introducing tetrads everywhere in space-time. Um, and people in the parity, the debate about parity violation, have suggested this might be a way uh, to accommodate um, the breaking of uh, mirror symmetry in quantum mechanics. It might necessitate the introduction of this piece of space time structure. And I entirely agree with Baker that the following conditional if we accept the reality of an orientation field that should count as a piece of space time structure. But I rather disagree that you can't account for this by inertial frame functionalism. So this is really just meant to be an illustration of how strong a thick definition of inertial frames is and how much it can accommodate. Um, so why introduce an orientation field in the first place? What this, what's this debate all about? It's a little bit of a thing about the second floor, um, but hopefully this is crept into the philosophy of physics somewhere. So particularly in the early 2000s, there was this big debate um, in the literature about uh, what was the right response to the parity violation features of the standard model. Oh, I've lost my image. I'm sorry. That's meant to be a picture of uh, um, a beta decay being handed. And so you'll have to imagine your best non mirror symmetric beta decay picture that you possibly can. But the, there's this famous 1957 experiment that found terribly, terribly, um, uh, terribly, terribly illuminating, well, surprising, which shows that right, certain kinds of quantum processes um, are not mirror symmetric. There's a preferred, there's a kind of there's a left-handed preference in these kinds of um, in these kinds of processes. So beta decay is one type of process. And then the idea is that well maybe we want to introduce, and I'm actually I'm not endorsing this argument, um, but here's an argument you might have. You might want to introduce a piece of space-time structure to accommodate this. Um, so we have certain phenomena and underlying physics which are not symmetric under parity transformations under mirror symmetry. Um, if that's going to be the case, um, if some system undergoing beta decay is going to emit um, particles in a handed direction, it's going to be the case it knows whether it's left-handed or right-handed. And everyone agrees that left-hands and right-hands are intrinsically the same, so how do you characterize this? And the thought is, well, the only way a particle could know if it's left-handed or right-handed is if there's some kind of field that tells it locally at every point in space-time. The only other option is that handedness, handedness can be determined by relation to other handed processes and objects. But that requires some kind of non-locality. You only know you're handed because you like that right-handed process that happened over there with some kind of spooky action at distance going on. So maybe the right way to deal with this is the way we do in other space-time debates by introducing um, some kind of orientation field. Um, so you don't have to buy that argument. But suppose you have, um, and you think that we should have orientation fields around. Um, do orientation fields count as space-time structure? So this is the kind of, um, you know, this is a classical, well, it's a quantum debate, but it's not a quantum gravity debate. But this is a kind of simple test case for the kind of thing I think that the definition of the space-time world can do. You've got a putative piece of structure 
someone's had some reason for introducing it into your theory. You can have a separate debate about the reification of that piece of structure, but now you want to ask the question, is it part of the space-time structure? Now, for the inertial frame functions, that's going to depend on whether an orientation field plays a role in defining the structure of inertial frames. Now, there's no question that an orientation field doesn't completely characterize space-time. It's not a rich enough structure. But you might think in a parity violating universe, um, might an orientation field alongside the metric and connection play a role in determining inertial structure and its counterpart space time structure? I think the answer to that is just yes. Pres exactly the reason why you think an orientation field might part of space time structure is because it does pick out something like the set of preferred reference frames. The preferential handedness you see in beta decay is a consequence of the fact that only left handed components of a given Dirac field couple to W bosons. So the handedness in the electroweak interaction. The laws governing electroweak interactions distinguish between right and left components of a field. Um, and the relevant sense of left and rightness is referred to handedness of a standard Cartesian coordinate system. So the laws underpinning the interaction give a uniform form in the right handed coordinates associated with a particular class of inertial frames. That's what's going on here. When you write down your laws, you have to write them down such that the form is not the same in left handed versus right handed inertial coordinates. And what, so once you've fixed the coordinate <coughs> support of the laws, a set of inertial frames of particular handedness is selected. And the function of the orientation field is precisely to pick out a preferred club hand. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe we we'll have to skip the physics a bit. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, apologies, my um, my run through got lost in the snow. Um, <laughs> so it's a slightly jumpy. Um, so the function of an orientation field is precisely to pick out a preferred class of tetrad fields and their associated coordinates to pick out a set of inertial frames. And maybe that's weird because we aren't used to thinking of inertial frames as the kind of thing that come at handedness, but it looks like if you really absorbed this kind of parity lesson and you bought this argument for the orientation field, that's exactly what you'd be buying. You'd be buying into the idea that it wasn't, you couldn't describe the laws of physics in the same form equally well in left and right handed coordinates. You were picking out preferred inertial structure. Um, so I think I, I will skip over this, I mean, the trouble is that there's a problem in the midst of all of this, and this is, so, what you do when you actually, um, uh, when you just pick out the left-handed versus the right-handed hand components in the Dirac field, um, is you write down these definitions in terms of the usual gamma matrices, and there is a complication here, there's a weird kind of symmetry, there's a weird kind of underdetermination, because if you described all of this in terms of, if you swapped the sense of your coordinates, Precisely what you end up doing is swapping these two definitions. So there's a kind of symmetry within the asymmetry, a descriptive redundancy here. You can choose to represent the form of the laws with respect to right-handed or with respect to left-handed coordinates. And you might worry about how that plays into the debate. Um, so there's something very tricksy about this asymmetry because you have a kind of freedom to pick whether you want to sort of start off trying to describe the whole thing in one sense or another. In fact, you have a kind of freedom to pick whether your orientation field is left-handed or right-handed in the first place. And if you've picked a left-handed orientation field, of course that has no meaning until you've written down the orientation field. But if you've picked a sense of orientation field, then the laws will have to take a particular form. And if you pick a different sense of orientation of field, the laws will have to take a different form. And those two formulations are empirically indistinguishable. And that's the heart of a lot of the debate about orientation fields. They look kind of unpleasantly underdetermined. Is that a problem for the inertial frame functionist? Well, look, no. And I think there is a reason uh, why I think it's sort of interesting more broadly for this kind of project, um, because it says something about methodology. The kind of underdetermination that comes because you have a choice about whether you start off representing everything in a right-hand set of coordinates or a left-hand set of coordinates reflects an underdetermination of the definition of an orientation field to begin with. Do you perfectly well use that as an argument not to introduce this piece of structure into your theory in the first place? Um, but if you have decided to reify a piece of structure, once you have, it has a perfectly sensible connection to the notion of an inertial frame. 
it's a piece of structure that's underdetermined, not the and, and the notion of inertial frame is underdetermined as a result of that. So I think that methodology is part of the functionalist view. Because to some extent, what should, one should do is settle questions about what kinds of structure you admit into your ontology. And of course, this actually spreads out to the, the point about the emergence debate. You have to puzzle out what kinds of things you think. If you think that the emergence question is partly what you admit into your higher level ontology, you sort those questions out independently of the space time question. And then you use your space time functionalism to work out which of those things that you decided to accept into your ontology count as space time structure. Okay. Um, the more general moral of this is that, you know, if you do proper credence to the kind of insight that Harvey Brown had and uses rather rich notion of inertial frame, inertial frame functionalism can cope with a lot more than people often uh, think it can. So why did Dave Baker think this was a great counterexample to my view? And I think it's <coughs> risk to my mill. Right? Well, I think people sometimes think that inertial frame functionalism is just capturing one tiny little element of the space-time role, namely the possibility of capturing the inertial trajectories um, of bodies. But the whole point about that rather rich definition of inertial frame that included the form of the laws was that it does an awful lot more than that. So Baker thought this was a counterexample because the inertial trajectories are totally unaffected by the introduction of a sense of handedness. But a richer notion of inertial frame captures much more of that. Um, and again, I think that richer notion of inertial frame is the kind of thing that starts to capture questions of localization, questions of uh, space time, area, and volume. It's like more argument needed there. Um, but I think it does quite a lot to capture a lot of the functional roles that we want. So it's a great project to kind of get on with. Um, trying to interpret space-time theories with. We may discover it doesn't work in certain contexts, and I'm not going to be surprised when that happens. But I think that it's a, it's a deeply, it's extremely useful to at least have some kind of shorthand for this non-complicated functional role on the table. I think this edition does that quite well. All right, so conclusions. We should be space-time functionalists. Um, the position allows for emergent space-time, so it doesn't explain the emergence of space-time. Um, there's a lot of room for constructive debate about the functional role of space-time. But inertial frame functionalism is something like an excellent working hypothesis. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> this is a row of questions here. I'll take it from the left, Tusha. Okay, just really, this is really quick, just a clarification question. But now, um, on this um, this parity violating example, mm. on the on this sort of. Um, extended view of what, a, of what an inertial frame is that comes with the handedness. Does that now mean that the space time symmetry group is no longer the entire proper group, which is the, which yeah. is the connected component to it? Yeah, and I think that's exactly, if you really think that an orientation feels the right way to deal with parity violation, that's exactly the conclusion that you ought to reach. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so it turns out you are, it's, it's not going to be the full point group. But we're going to restrict yourself to only. Um, Yes, so, so only the, those concrete transformations which preserve the, the sense of the orientation of things. <laughs> James? Um, thanks. So consider general relativity with a strong point of space, then locally metric and the symmetry of space. And I take it that's, that's why the inertial frame function is the metric field that takes out the structure of the inertial frames and so it should qualify as a situation to form. But I think Harvey has also stressed that, I mean, this can at best be a necessary condition for the metric field to have proper geometric significance. So you need the existence of stable blocks and blocks that these can be reasonable, et cetera. So I guess my concern about inertial frame functionalism is it doesn't take into account these other factors. So you can imagine a case in which metric comes down and so just looking for the site, you just can't build any blocks and blocks. And then should you count the metric field to be spatiotemporal and um, so I, I'm interested to know what, how an inertial frame functionalist would reply to that kind of worry. And I think, by the way, Tushar might articulate. He's definitely saying yeah. exactly the same thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so I think this is in one of those places where, where this is a housekeeping rather than a stipulative project, in, in the following sense. Um, if there are rods and clocks somewhere else in the theory and they're surveying some other kind of metric, then there's a real debate to be had about whether you're pushing out correct set of inertial frames. Right. If there is nothing like an ordinary measuring device in your theory, then of course the sense in which you have full space temporal significance in the normal empirical sense is attenuated. But one can at least say, look, I have space-time structure in, in this sense. So I mean, as I say, if you stick to your own, I think 
one might apply the same so the, the sort of um, uh, the string theory case is an interesting case of this. You have these cases where you have a metric that's picking out an initial structure um, in some space that's incredibly far removed from an empirical space, and it's not from a logical space. But at least if one notes that it's playing the same kind of role that the metric does with respect to phenomenological dynamics, one can pick out a sense in which it's taking a space-time role. We're just going to have to be a little bit careful to say, you know, because of the nature of the dynamical fields in this, it doesn't have the, the full significance. So in a sense, I don't think that that should be a kind of, and precisely because you're a functionist about this stuff, there isn't a table-thumping debate to be had over whether it's really space-time. There's just this rather careful housekeeping debate to say, in this particular place, the connection between inertial frames and the behavior of macroscopic bodies has come apart because there are no macroscopic bodies. Um, we apply the same kind of questions in an only dust universe, or a, and there, there are lots of, kind of counterfactuals you can come up with where, um, where Harvey's notion of chronogeometric significance, which is a, a very important and, and empirical one, is going to come apart from uh, this notion of the space time role because there will be nothing in the theory of chronogeometric significance. Yeah, I thought that was only a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, just really kind of go on with what John was saying. I think um, the, the question of, of whether active groups are uh, realizable or whether there exists macroscopic worlds and clocks, uh, that's completely a red herring in this context. Uh, just to rephrase what, what I think you said, um, functionalism is just to pick out certain theoretical entities. Um, Nothing over and above that, whether they're realizable in the physical clock, that's a completely different question that has nothing to do whatsoever with um, with functionalism. Uh, with, with, yeah, with, with functionalism or the way we use functionalism as this reference picking uh, device. But this leads me to a, um, a wider question, namely, you said functionalism is the only game in town. And I think there are two interesting questions there. Firstly, how many games are there? Um, I think it, the whole debate would benefit a lot from having opening our textbooks of philosophy of mind and going all, through all the various variants of functionalism. Com you, you mentioned at the beginning something like the, the folk theoretic platitude. That would correspond yeah. to something like common sense functionalism. But of course we've got things like empirical functionalism yeah. or theoretical functionalism. And then the, the second kind of sub category here would be, well, the theoretical worlds, how do we characterize them in terms of their causal worlds, which is the one um, aspect of the empirical functionalism, or by their theoretical worlds. If it's the theoretical world, that's maybe what you said you were saying, well, there are some problem, well-known problems in the philosophy of mind. So I think, I think it would be extremely rewarding to look very closely at a the analogs, the counterparts of the philosophy of mind kind of functionalism and the philosophy of physics kind of functionalism. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I have tried to do that. And one of the things I've come to over the years is precisely because I think this debate has more in common with perhaps thoughts about kind of Lucy and ways of defining theoretical terms than it does with the philosophy of mind debate. My attempts to map positions onto positions of the philosophy of mind that want to be taken this have, I think, been rather misleading. And I, and I therefore, one of the conclusions that sort of I've reached on my opening of the philosophy of mind, the first thing, obviously, when I thought, well, I should be a functionist, the first thing I did was say, oh, I should look at the philosophy of mind. And I thought, oh, God, functionalism is a mess in the philosophy of mind. And I thought, oh, well, do I have to map this mess onto what's going on in philosophy of physics? I spent a long time trying to do it. And then ultimately, I've sort of come to this conclusion that lots of these debates are inactive for kinds of reasons. Um, as I said, in part because we don't have these independent ways of making reference uh, to different kinds of different ways of specifying a given state, such that some of these um, debates make sense. And partly because I don't think there is an analogue of a folk theoretical attitude view. And, and so I think that there's I'm not so much. Sure about that, actually. I mean, so perhaps so. I, so yeah, so that's something that, that requires that requires an argument because one of those I mean, there certainly are folk theoretical attitudes about space and time, and perhaps it is a derivation of the space-time debate is how space-time connects up to notions of space and time. I actually just think that, in fact, you know, most people in this room have a very specific theoretical notion of space-time. <coughs> it's actually gone a very long way away from folk theoretical attitudes about space and time. So I think that's one of these I think it's slightly, slightly challenging. I mean, I would welcome somebody else doing that project. I just, for, for myself, I 
found it unconstructive in various kinds of ways and got kind of a bit lost in the mire and then concluded that really what was going on was a slightly different kind of debate where a few things that have gone on for us we might not be applicable, but really, um, you know, functional definitions were all over the place in science. And we're better off thinking about uh, the way we use functional definitions elsewhere in science than we are um, thinking about this very specifically uh, problematic case of philosophy of mind. There's plenty of functionalisms elsewhere. I think there might be a bit of that. I'm not convinced because clearly what the, the functionalism that you are um, endorsing is what Brandon Mitchell was called empirical yeah. functionalism. And I, I just think it, it would be very helpful to have a, some kind of tail away, go through the, the various functionalisms and then compare what would be the counterparts, or would yeah. the very concept make sense? I just think there's a lot of those, yeah. I think there's a lot of those in the empty spaces on the Yeah, that's that, that, but we should be very clear about the reasons why they don't have counterparts in philosophy and physics. And I think this would clarify such misunderstandings such, such as uh, James was, was uh, mm -hmm. uh, mentioning. Um, yeah, no, no, I, mean, I, I can, as I say, I mean, I perhaps have, I don't written down the table, but I think, I think the table probably represents some of my kind of trying to come out of confusion and philosophy of mind. It's just that I've decided so many of those places are vacuous. And I've also found, I suppose there's also a dialectical point, which is I've sometimes found overconnected to philosophy of mind literature just leads you down that area where you're endlessly describing why some particular debate doesn't particularly apply, which is sort of why I've moved to sort of trying to think about this theoretical term conceptual yeah. functionalism. I found it's been less misleading. It's more of a kind of heuristic strategy. Yeah. Um, to kind of harvest what yeah. has been done already. No, I think that's right. I think you may be more optimistic about all the, all the brilliant advances in understanding functionalism that's happening. But I, so I still feel very optimistic and then decided that, that inheriting somebody else's mess was not what I wanted to do in this <laughs> yeah. debate. So I'm naturally very interested in uh, where you think that uh, your view and our view uh, diverge, and or where we get off the track or somehow <laughs> take a false turn. Or, I don't know how we you want to put it, but it seems to be that you think we falsely think that space-time functionalism more than allows for it, the emergence of space-time, but somehow explains it, and. I would like to understand a little bit better in which way it doesn't explain it. Because as, as, as we try to, to, to argue, say, look, wh what, do you, what do you do as a space-time functionalist? You say, well, here are the roles space-time plays, here are the sort of things it does, um, here's, uh, you know, the, and, and to give a list, whatever that is, whether it, it has, it connects with inertial frames, or, or I mean, that's a yeah. separate story. But suppose you've done that, and now I go to my favorite quantum theory of gravity, and I tell you how the things it postulates and the, the dynamics they have, or the structure they have, or whatever, from that theory, I show you that I can give you, I can check off each and every item on the list, on the first list that you had to compile. Haven't I explained the emergence of space-time? What's, what's missing? I think you've explained something about the space-time structure there. I just think that, so, I mean, I wonder if this will come out. I mean, so I think that you're going to have, let's say, you're going to have this sort of strong reductionist that say, all you've done is you've shown me, perhaps, yes, I, I'm going to be a functionist, and I agree that you've um, shown me space-time structure, but you haven't shown me that space-time structure has emerged. You've just pointed to space-time structure in your new theory. So I think it's just that, that that question is, there's going to be a separate question about how levels of discourse interrelate. And so in some cases when you do that project, the way in which you're going to be showing me that something is actually a space-time structure is via a kind of series of approximations and such variable changes of interesting kinds. And sometimes you're just going to point to something and going, that thing right there is playing the role completely directly. And I think in one of some of those cases you might be doing something there's not really an emergent. I mean so you might just replace space-time structure in general in, in our ordinary sense in general relativity with a more fundamental notion. Um, and there you haven't claimed there's a non-fundamental space-time structure, you just said space-time structure is different from how you thought it was. Mm -hmm. It's like this. And then there are going to be other cases in, in theories of quantum gravity where you're saying, actually, this space-time structure is interestingly approximate, and then this is where you're going to have to engage in these debates about emergence. Um, this kind of space-time structure is going to, um, uh, is only going to emerge if we take certain approximative limits or if we, think about taking the superposition states of, of, of you know, gravity states, you know, some, 
we're going to have one of these interesting processes. And then there's going to be some sense in which you might want to say, there's a higher level space-time structure and there's a lower level structure that leads to it. Um, and so it's just that I think that this explanation of the emergence of space-time is going to be done in lots of, of that work. And that one can have the functionist proposal without any reduction or emergence of say. I mean, I think that if you look at classical theories, you can have this debate without reduction of emergent centering the picture. So it may be that we don't disagree. I mean, this is partly, I think, somewhere you've articulated it as a disagreement because you want this project. Didn't you? Or huh? Didn't you uh, articulate Oh, I did hear. That was, that was, that, that was, but, oh, but, you, but, you, but you said, you said <laughs> that the problem with my, the problem with my program, the problem with my program, the problem with my program is that I am, um, I am not talking about emergent space, so I can't use this project to explain um, the emergence of space time. Yeah, so I think, so I just think okay. that actually, okay. I, I think that, I mean, perhaps, I mean, wonderful for us to agree to agree right? <laughs> at the end of this. So I don't think it's a major disagreement. Okay. okay. Um, I think, we, just, sorry, I think we have to stop. Very very briefly, briefly, very briefly, very briefly. Briefly. I think our, our framework is, is, a, is a broad framework, and, and yeah. it's a case of functional reduction. Mm -hmm. yes, it's theory. And, this can, and then there's the next step, uh, as, as, a, as a kind of functional reduction we propose, there are features in certain cases, in maybe most cases in Monterey, where it's also a case of functional mm -hmm. emergence. Yeah. The, this case of what you mentioned before, yeah. robustness, maybe some uh, aspects of universality in some sense. And these aspects can be well accommodated in, in, in this kind of functional structure we're proposing. And, and together, gives you a good account of the relationship between these two levels. Right? What do you think? So I just think the relationship between the two levels needs to be articulated separately. So I think it's only functionalist reduction if you already have two levels and understand that they're different levels. And then there are yeah. interesting questions to be asked about the two okay. different levels. So if you take yeah. out the levels talk in your functionalist reduction, there's no reduction there at all. As I say, you can just apply it in GR. So the thing that's making it a reductive program is a pre-existing understanding yeah. of a higher level theory and a lower level theory. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I think we sort of in our paper assumed that that was yeah. already there. That's the debate to which we sort of yeah. step to it now, try to pick up. Yeah, which I think I'm very happy with. Okay. Just that okay. Yeah. If, you, if you're doing it in the classical context, you're not going to be having that debate. No, of course. You're doing the same course. thing, effectively. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. So we're all happy now, so let's thank you again yes. for this. <laughs>